five, four, three, two, If it's Tuesday, you know that can mean only one thing. It's time for you, me, and we to get together and talk about the craft and business of making comics. And you know what? I can't think of a better guest than the one that we have tonight. We'll be talking with you about what you need to know about IDW, uh, breaking in, staying in, editing, writing, creating. Uh, it's an exciting moment for me because I've known this uh, creator for years and years. And I would love to bring Mike Fasola on, but unfortunately, unfortunately, Mike is indeed rebooting his computer. So we're just going to skip over all of that and bring on Jamie S. Rich, the new editor in chief of IDW. Hold on, Jamie. Let me go. Hold on. Jamie S. Rich. I had to cue the music, Jamie, because it, it wouldn't have been the same without the music. I, I always have to have my entry music. And speaking of entrance music, uh, this is um, my co-host, Mike Pasolo. Jamie, do you do you remember Mike from the Wizard days? Mike was Mike shared an office with me. He wasn't particularly nice. I don't know that he ever dealt with us. Oni might have been too small for him. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, uh, Mike, Mike, Mike had a minimum level of who he yeah. would deal with, right, Mike? But he, but he liked to put me in the back of the office, so I couldn't really see anybody. I had to face the wall. I feel like it was you, buddy, and a lot of Mike Cotton. But then having that work with Mike Cotton at DC, I just, if, if any Mike Cotton feels like too much. <laughs> what, a, you, now, what you now have is more Buddy Scalera, Jamie. More Buddy Scalera than you ever wanted. <laughs> so uh, by way of introduction, everybody, um, you guys know my co-host, Mike Fasolo, three-time Emmy Award-winning screenwriter and Former wizard guy, I am Buddy Sclera, comic book writer extraordinaire. Um, I'm the only person that considers myself extraordinaire, so that's the only reason I apply it. But really, who's extraordinary here tonight is Jamie Esrich, who's been in comics since, what, before 1994 is when you got started at DC Comics? Yeah. Wow, 94. that's probably around when we met, Jamie. That's So, Jamie, you were at DC, you were at Dark Horse, you were at Oni. Um, you were a tapas, and now you've landed at the editor-in-chief role of IDW. Uh, amazing career. Yeah, I, I somehow managed to stay one step ahead of the Reaper and uh, continue to fail upwards, as I call it. <laughs> but uh, someone on my left DC, I think it was Andy Corey, the editor, put it that um, I had ran all the bases there. Because uh, I worked there 2015 to 2022, I guess, um, and or 2021 time is crazy now. But you know, I worked on I started in Vertigo, Young Animal, then went to Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Justice League. So I did really get like a full a full taste of all of that. Yeah, I don't think there's anybody that doesn't know you, Jamie. Or and most of them regret it. <laughs> no. That's not true. That's not true. So, Jamie, um, uh, a great career, been doing this through the 90s, highly respected. Um, how did you land here at IDW, uh, and what is your role here as editor-in-chief? What, what are you responsible for? So, uh, I was at Tapas after DC, and was kind of curious, because I was looking at that as sort of as an interesting, I wanted to see what the webtoon thing was like. They were looking to build a new line of originals. So I was like, going, oh, I can go back to like creator driven comics. Um, after about 10, nine months or so, I could start to see like, this isn't really happening. 
Um, so I was sort of starting to look around and Maggie Howell, who is group editor of original comics at IADW, but also worked with my, me at Vertigo, uh, reached out and said, you know, we're really, we're missing a person. We need a senior editor, ex an executive editor to work on all the licensed comics. And would you be interested in just talking to us? Um, I knew Mark Doyle because we had worked together at DC, who was also working on the originals at the time. Nachi Marsham and I had known each other for a while. Um, Nachi, former wizard guy, right? Yeah, yeah. And and so, and then, you know, he, our paths crossed because when Bob Schreck left Oni, Nachi ended up working with Bob at DC. Um, so we had Bob Schreck stories to share. Uh, so it seemed interesting. It seemed at the right time. I jumped um, and so I've been there since now about a year and was running the licensed group. Um, really proud of the good team I had there. I got us, we've gone from like a 15% on time ratio to like, sometimes we hit the nineties, uh, usually around the seventies, eighties. Uh, we just, we're super happy because we've been adjusting to new distribution and yeah. getting covers on time. Um, we just had a hundred percent aspect of uh, release ratio for all of our a covers, which are the main ones to get in. So uh yeah i've really just been kind of excited to build that team and now um uh, editor-in-chief of all things as publishing as opposed to licensed so looking at both licensed and create our own so kind of going back to my dark horse days where that's what we did there was you know straddling the line so i was you know, working on buffy the vampire slayer while also editing dark horse presents and all of mike allred stuff so Kind of getting back to a zone where like that's you know that's kind of company where you have your licensed comics over here, but then you get to experiment and do interesting things with creators, uh, which is kind of where a lot of my passion lies. So uh, now that you're you know at the top, you're the editor in chief. Uh, what's your plan for IDW? Go crazy with power, become maniacal, egotistical, and difficult to deal with, or do you have something else in mind? Because that's what Mike and I would do. Right. Well, I want to continue the mission of like sort of really seeing how far we can take some of our licenses. I mean, we've had great success in recent years. Um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is a juggernaut, but the last Ronin series is of, with Kevin Eastman back on in the writing chair with Tom Waltz. Like that's a, a phenomenon. Like it, it's unlike anything I've ever seen in comics, the way that particularly now the hardcover of the first series sells, like we can't keep it in print. Um, if there were, and if there were sales charts anymore, we would probably be out selling. We'd be number one a lot of the time for so that, that series. Um, so trying to do stuff like that, what Heather Antos is doing on Star Trek, where we're creating a unified sort of set of books where they're crossing over. We're about to have our big new, uh, our first time crossing over Star Trek and Star Trek Defiant uh, for this event called Day of Blood that kicked off at Free Comic Book Day. Um, Star Trek also nominated for Best New Series at the Eisners, first time the Eisners have ever been that noticed Star Trek. So we're very excited about that stuff. Congratulations uh, to Heather and to you on that. We yeah. we uh, we know Heather. She she's uh, she's a friend of the show. So congratulations on the Eisner nomination. That's wonderful. So again, trying to make see what we can do with our licenses to take them to new heights. Uh, looking for new licenses. What's going to be the next thing that we should dive into? Um, and then you know, last summer we launched sort of a new a new renewed initiative with our originals. Um, Actually, I have it right here. The the uh, started with Dark Spaces Wildfire by Scott Snyder and Hayden Sherman, which I don't know if anyone's read. And this this I collection, seen it yet. Love so this it. Love the design. Out, out. Yeah, uh, un, unlike anything you've read from Scott Snyder, it's it's a crime comic about uh, a here in California where we have lots of fires. Uh, a female a group of female prisoners who were sent out to fight the fires. Mm. And one of them says, you know, I know uh, over the hill is where this cer certain rich guy lives that I used to work for. And he's the reason I'm in jail. So while this fire is happening, if we want to go over there and rob him, I know how to do it. <laughs> Sounds like and, a good plan. That's actually yeah, a pretty so, good plan. So it's real. It's just excellent. Hayden Sherman, uh, they are becoming like a really impressive artist. They did some stuff on a, uh, detective comics at dc recently 
Um, they've worked a lot with Sean Lewis at Image, but this work really sort of goes to the next level. Um, takes Scott's very grounded crime story and adds some, some really sort of interesting abstract elements to it, but in general, just a great, yeah, great crime story. So that kicked off a whole new focus on creator owned stuff. So you've got Earth Divers by Stephen Graham Jones and Ricardo Bercelli. Um, you just had the new, because so Dark Spaces is Scott Snyder's kind of curating people. So we just launched Good Deeds uh, by Shay Grayson that Scott helped develop. And, and we have coming up Hunger in the Dusk with uh, by G. Willow Wilson and Chris Wild Goose. It's just an awesome fantasy series. Um, everyone keeps joking. They use the hashtag hot orc summer because there's definitely some sexy orcs. <laughs> oh, easy there with the sexy. But, but by the way, I don't want to go too far. We're gonna we're gonna show that, Mike. Uh, you know, I know you love this more than anybody in the world, Mike. Uh, sexy you orcs. Love people's sexy uh, orcs. pieces. Well, you love sexy orcs. Um, but uh, Jamie was nice enough to show us. Uh, what is, is this your home office that that we have a picture of here, Jamie? Yeah, this is actually where I'm sitting right now. So it looks sort of sparse from that angle, but so you're seeing in front of me, um, behind me is the, the rest of the office. Um, so this is where I do work most of the time. Uh, you can see the printer down in the bottom corner with, of course, stuff stacked on it. Comics stacked <laughs> everywhere. As everywhere, in, no as doubt. Yeah. So <laughs> records over in the other corner. So yeah, behind me is my turntable. Um, I've got a station that's like a laptop just for my digital music. Uh, so it's like, I don't, they're trying to convince me that I should work in the regular office more. And it's like, why would I? Would yeah, I absolutely. Yeah, and, you've got that, and you've got that mad Ottoman there. I mean, how could you leave that? I mean, <laughs> yeah. right there, you've got a thinner rack. The Ottoman is actually a secret storage space. You lift the top off and there's all kinds not of, just, not a secret anymore, Jamie, not a secret anymore. <laughs> where all my important papers are. And yeah, I got a spinner rack. <laughs> That were, that's where that's where Jamie keeps all the important contracts and cash money. Yes, that's right. Yes. So when there's a fire, we'll know where to get those stuff when we rob his house. Yeah. Well, if he can get past my uh, my angry pug, he's uh, very vicious. He's now, why do all the comic pros have uh, sp maybe Mike? Maybe we'd be getting more writing work in comics if we had a spinner rack. That's true. I'd have to go find one, but yeah, that would help. I feel I like you say pugs because pugs like bring people together. And Mike Norton, Joel Jones, me, we all have pugs. And if you tell me you have a pug, suddenly I'm talking to you. Like you really like, Mike, Mike, when you do the pitch, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to show the picture of uh, of your pugs. You don't have pugs, Mike. You got other little Yeah, other little critters. little monsters, yeah. What are those little critters? Yeah. One's a, one's like a corgi, the other one's like a chihuahua poodle. They're all just mixes. They're loud and barky and i don't and, think jamie's impressed i think he no. would have wanted you to have a, a but I'm, I'm thinking about getting a pug i've had some bad corgi run-ins <laughs> all right so jamie you were just teasing us and um we're going to get into the details of what people need to know about breaking in staying in getting the attention of editors but first let's dive into that comic you were just talking about let's let's pull that up right now and show uh, the title, The Hunger and the Dusk. You want to just, you want to set the table of what this is? Yeah, so Hunger and the Dusk begins by G. Willow Wilson and artist Chris Wild Goose. People know G. Willow Wilson from Wonder Woman, um, from Miss, being the, the writer who originally wrote uh, Kamala Khan, Ms. Marvel. Uh, so this is a, a dream project of hers that editor Maggie Howell brought in and they've been working on. Um, and it's essentially the, the main setup is at a time where there's a bigger threat coming humans and orcs have to team up to combat that. Um, you know, uh, other, before that there, there had been enemies. Uh, there's an interesting thing running through the early couple of issues about, uh, the you know there's a character who he's a minstrel and he's like oh man all my songs have like bad things about orcs in them because you grow up being told uh, you know orcs are bad they're gonna come and they're gonna eat you and in the middle of the night that kind of thing and so seeing these groups of people come together and having to figure out how do we fight a common foe how do we get along how do we change minds about ourselves uh, so and there's a lot of romance. 
Uh, there's definitely like, you know, orc things across the lines as we were joking earlier, hot orc summer. Uh, so it's a, an epic story with lots of, you know, interpersonal relationships followed by, you know, lots of action. Like every, the first two issues both have like big action sequences. Um, the second issue you get to see like, oh, here come, here come the bad guys that they've all been waiting for. Now, Jamie, uh, there's a question from the audience. What's up with the four-fingered hand on the on the right there? I believe that's an orc hand, but I'm not it's positive. An orc hand. All right. I'm not positive because I I didn't count the fingers when I was reading. I'm not the editor, so I don't. Have <laughs> not to your job to count the fingers. <laughs> I have to remember who's who's how many fingers. Is somebody, there is somebody in charge of finger counting? Yes, uh, that would be uh, uh, probably uh, assistant editor Jake Williams. I think he's the finger counter, and I. Uh, that second cover was Cliff Chang, who's doing variants for all issues. Like, as everyone knows, Cliff Chang is the bomb. And but so the fact that he signed on to do B covers for all of them is nice. So um, expect to see more four fingered hands. <laughs> it's just some. It's just some guy. Uh, Philip just filled it in for you. Uh, no need to research that any further. It's actually it's four fingered so Philip. Four fingered Philip. He's, <laughs> he's being modest. Oh, okay. That could be a lady hand. It could be a lady hand. It could be an orc hand. But what do we have here? I believe this, you gave us a couple sequence pages uh, and yeah. I put them together um, to show the behind the scenes. I, I put them all in there. We don't have time to go through each one, but if there's anything you want to call out, uh, this is a sequence of, what are we looking at here, Jamie? So this is just essentially pencils, inks, and colors. Um, but this is a sequence when our main characters come together. And uh, the human in the, in the scene is wondering, why have you called me here? Why am I the guy? And, um, you know, and the orc, is, the leader of the orcs is basically telling him, like, because we know we can trust you because you stand and fight um, and you leave no one behind. And so this is their, but, you know, you're getting a little bait switch in this moment where at first it seems like they're at odds, but then you realize, oh, they're just working together. These are two warriors greeting each other um, and flexing. But, yeah, you can see the process here of how the art comes together and just how, like, awesome it's going to be. And I think in the next one, there's a slight variation in the uh, panel one, top left corner, where you can see the face uh, shifts a little bit, I guess, maybe change of emotion or the way they wanted to portray it. Anything uh, that artists who are watching this uh, could learn from this or. I mean, I'm not sure what the note was given here, but I think sort of the thought probably was, was to equalize them. If you notice in the first, in the pencil, oh, okay. the second panel, you're much tighter on the, uh, the orc himself. And in the final inks, you actually pull back and they're pretty much the same. So it's it's them coming together and them finding a certain level of, of camaraderie. And so I think that was sort of the notion of no, the orc is no longer as imposing in the panel. Um, but you'll see in general, I think Chris works with much looser pencils mm -hmm. and does a lot more in the inks, uh, which I think is becoming more common, particularly people who work with digital. Uh, you can kind of sort of re envision everything again. Well, I, I have to tell you, um, I'd like to give a shout out to your colorist um, as I was going through this. Um, wow. I mean, the colorist is just fantastic, um, adding all kinds of great effects uh, throughout the book. And uh, I, I didn't know how to pronounce the name, and I didn't want to make any assumptions <laughs> on. I am not sure either how the name is pronounced. Um, for those yeah, at home, it's spelled M-S-A-S-S-Y-K. It's a one named color is. So, Mike, what, how would you pronounce that? Smith. <laughs> I'm fairly certain that's as good as any other pronunciation, Mike. <laughs> had I been thinking ahead, I would have asked Maggie how to, to pronounce it, but I, I, you know, the day got away from me. Well, we'll um, welcome you back to the show just to for that one part. <laughs> be a out. special pop-in guest. It was, but, yeah. yeah they, they are doing an incredible job with the coloring, and the whole thing kind of just has a very vibrant feel to it. Um, mm -hmm. And then when you know action hits and it needs to go dark, it goes dark. So, the, is this book an all digital workflow? You just said that the artist is the artist working on digital tablet. I'm or? not sure what the actual combination of it is. Um, 
that is my guess, but like, is, like I, again, am not the actual editor on this, so I haven't talked through the process with them. Um, but part of me is just give either that or like these, they jump straight from pencils to full inks because these pencils are looking more like breakdowns when you compare them like really good thumbnails. Yeah, so, um, so, so they may, may, they may just jump in that sense on paper, but I think there is some kind of digital component going on here. Yeah. It kind of looks and like I, graphite, doesn't it? I mean, it looks like pencils on the uh, far left. Yeah. Cause it partially reminds me looking at this, the process of my buddy, Joel Jones, where like you kind of really see it come together once the ink is applied. So even here you see the, there's a looser construction in the yep. pencils to the faces and then like particularly that panel four mm -hmm. and then the expressions really come together once the ink is laid down. Yeah. I, um, I'm a little jealous that you're friends with Joel Jones. Can I just say that, uh, I loved lady killers, just such a great artist. And she's doing more. She's, uh, cause she took over in full complete. She mo wrote, probably 90 percent of series one i was way over credited um and then she took over the writing for series two and um she is currently publishing series three on zest world and uh i know has some pretty interesting things in the pipeline yeah well lady killer lady killer i'm sorry i said lady killers phenomenal yeah. if you guys haven't checked that out just a chef's kiss love it <laughs> in idw we've been leaning on her for covers um, I just am reviving our Adams family license. And so I've been talking to her about maybe writing some of that stuff, but um, I know she's got a Star Trek cover in the works. Um, and in general, um, just, yeah, uh, looking forward to seeing what she does next. I will buy anything Joel Jones draws. So it doesn't matter what she draws. I'll, it, I'll buy it. And what's this? Okay. So we're, we're still, we're I think this is the last page we're going to show. Yeah. Right. This is all one sequence. So this is now that the, the orcs and the humans have come together. Here you, you starting the beginning of a pep talk of getting ready. Of, we're going to get prepared for battle. Um, and yeah, again, you can see lots of interesting choices from the basics of the layout. One thing I will shout out to Chris, and actually th this is why now that I think about it, these are layouts versus pencils. Um, balloon placement. Mm. So many artists don't think about that. And the best thing to do in your layouts is to sort of create that space to try to figure out well, what's the dialogue going here. And so, so granted, he does make a choice on the bottom panel here to be like, well, they might cover up these figures if I move them um, because there's a definitely a different placement going on there. But there's also other choices I could make as an editor to work with the letter for where the balloons would go. But just the idea that he's thinking ahead. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, this is the space that I need. That is so crucial and so often doesn't happen. And that's why when you're like, why are there balloons on top of this face or whatever? Uh, that's some cranky editor being like, well, screw them. They should know better. <laughs> um, well, sure. And then the reality is, is the artist will go and do work for, you know, if they're drawing backgrounds and this artist is drawing but not as many backgrounds in this case, but background figures. Yeah. And then they get covered up and they've wasted their own time. So they should trap some space based on, on the scripting, right? Yeah. Because if you look at, say, panel three here where there is no, the, the space is open and the colorist actually does a, a lot of great work with the, the clouds you can see in the sky. But when Chris was drawing it, he's like, okay, well, there's going to be two two balloons in this first guy speaking crucially is on the left or the only person speaking is on the left. So that's all easy to place. So it's like nothing needs to go there. Um, you know, and I think if you look at a lot more older comics there, when they were drawing, you know, Jack Kirby's doing whatever three a month, they <laughs> would understand that too. Like I don't need to draw that background because something's going to go there. And even in a conversation, when you drop that background away, you're, you're removing extraneous detail that doesn't need to be there and distract from the moment. So particularly in a good talking head sequence, like you're just all about the faces. It's all about the expression. Um, so I don't need to know yet if there's a tree behind them. Uh, you know, it's, it's just, I want to see them. Yeah. Right. You're not going to get points for something that gets covered up. Yeah. So you're just going to 
waste some time. And, and so uh, with this, Jamie, before we get into the next section, um, tell me again, where can people, uh, let's just go back to this. There's my advanced switcher, yeah. uh, literally scrolling through PowerPoint. Uh, when and where should people go uh, and get Hunger and the Dusk? So Hunger and the Dusk will be coming out uh, next month. It's actually on FOC, I think, in a week, two weeks. So now is the time to go to, or actually just FOC. No, no I'm sorry, I'm thinking of something else. Too many books coming out. It's FOCing, I think, in two weeks. But now is the time to go to your retailer and say, uh, this is a book I want. Uh, we're currently, so they've got previews to look at. Um, and it's going to be an ongoing, uh, starting off with like a, a, you know, with a opening arc, but it will continue to grow from there. And um, yeah, now is the time to go look for it because uh, we're just getting the word out. And uh, I think, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be, it's releases actually in July 12th. There's some time for Comic-Con. Um, so yeah, I think it's going to be a book people are going to talk about this summer. And it's just a lot of fun. Um, if you like strong character pieces, if you like action, if you like fantasy, this is the one to, to look at. And remember, uh, those of you out there in viewer land, uh, the way we say thank you to our creators is to go to support their books. Uh, they earn their living 50 cents at a time. So go ahead and go ahead and go out and buy or pre-order this. Uh, your retailer will be grateful for you to reorder uh, or order in advance. Now, Jamie, um, our audience, uh, it, it, it includes people who are both making comics, uh, hoping to break into comics, hoping to level up in comics. Uh, talk to me about what you've learned as an editor is a great way to get the attention of you or any of the editors uh, at IDW? So for me, I mean, my origin story has always been how I used to write comic letters to the comic books themselves and try to get printed in the letters column back in the 80s. And Kamiko is my jam, and I loved Grendel. And so I was writing to them all the time and managed to meet people that way, uh, pre-internet, going to com Comic-Con and saying, hey, I'm Jamie Rich. And they'd go, you're the guy that writes his letters. <laughs> and it's a conversation. Um, you know, Would they sometimes get you confused. Would you be like, I'm Jamie Rich? And they go, Are are you the same guy as Jamie S. Rich? Or is there a different surprise? You'd be surprised because I've done things where they drop the mill initial and people have asked. Like I've been at conventions and in person where like, are you the same if the S is there? <laughs> like, yes. Um, so don't discount that. Um, don't do that. All right. But yeah, these days it's you actually have pretty good access. Um you know, if you're, if the editor is out there and on social media, um, you do have access, you do have ways to put your work in, in online and try to get their attention that way. Honestly, it's a, it's a lot of persistence and a lot of uh, being someone who can communicate and who can talk to people. And, and uh, as Will Wheaton, I guess, would put it, don't be a dick. Um, Hold on, write that down, Mike. Yeah. A, a lot yeah. of it comes down to, you know, the work's really good, but then, uh, you know, how do you engage with the, an editor once you get their ear? How are you, because even we have to think about like, how are you going to be in a room with fans? How are you going to be in a room with your peers? Um, and then actually persistence is while don't be a pest, the fact that you continually sort of go like, Hey, I've got some new samples. Hey, I'm still working um, shows that you stick around and, my advice is usually like contact once you have a, someone's ear contact them again when you're like i have something different that shows some change not just i just did another drawing um and i we all see that even with professionals where it's just like i just did a sketch here it is it's on instagram love me <laughs> um you know that's not always going to show that you're you're working hard and improving so it's really like once you get in a space where you're being noticed it's sort of consistently um I could tell you really, like, I mean, this became somewhat of a story recently. I mean, like, there was these articles about this guy, Danny Earls, who is a British artist who is former soccer player. And Gail Simone tweeted out about him. And then suddenly Lee Bermejo tweeted out about him. And people started writing about him. And I was like, wait a minute. I know this story. And I dug back into my email. And I was like, Danny. Yeah, he wrote me a while ago. 
And I wrote and I looked like, okay, I was nice to him. I said good things. Uh, <laughs> so I, he doesn't hate me. So I wrote him there like, hey, dude, you're getting lots of attention. This is awesome. And it was because as he would find people to talk to, he granted had an interesting story. Like I'm a soccer player who loves to draw comics. And everyone's like, I love Ted Lasso. I'm American. I don't know soccer otherwise. Um, and he just was super nice and memorable. And I looked at the work again. I'm like, yeah, the stuff then was really good. It's been less than a year. And the stuff he's showing now is better. Um, but it, he just managed to... Anyone he contacted was so nice about it and so attention grabbing that you're like, okay, I remember you. Um, and now, now we've gotten to a point where he, I might not be able to work with him because he's gotten too many other offers because um, we were talking about something. <laughs> well, Mike, Mike, you have the same problem, right? Fasolo, you have yeah, far problem. too many offers, too many, far too many offers. Um, Philip uh, asks, is there a best social media platform to use? Uh. For, I mean, at this point, I don't know if you would hold back from any. I'm only on Instagram because I just want to see pictures. Um, so it's kind of like whatever is the best in terms of just showcasing your art. Um, you know, I, I don't want to denigrate necessarily any of the platforms, but like Twitter has so much other noise. I don't know how easy it is to get people to actually see your art again. Um mm. And I don't know if there's a better platform out anymore. Like Tumblr used to actually be great just for artwork and that kind of stuff. But um, he, he followed up with the Reserve Award. Yeah, I think <laughs> Tumblr. Tumblr. Yeah, yeah. I think Tumblr's pretty Tumble. got a lot of tumbleweeds these days. Mm -hmm. uh, Twitter. Mike is, is, you're still on uh, MySpace, right, Mike? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think Tom's the best my best friend. Is, the best thing is to have an online portfolio ready. Um, and you know you can get a pretty cheap website through squarespace or a service like that or if you find just some other hosting place but that's the thing is once once you get me with some illustration and i'm like hey wait who are you what is this um i think beyond your social if there's a link that's like here's my artwork here's how to contact me um here's a bunch of samples um that i think is crucial because uh, we do want to see a body of work uh, we don't want to just see like the one pinup you did that you got, you know, that you thought was really good. Um, we want to see sequentials. I would also clean out them every once in a while. Yeah. Um, just like you would if a physical portfolio, like you run out of space, like get rid of those old samples. Uh, stick with your best new samples. Um, but yeah, it's tough because there's a lot of noise for you to cut through. But like, you know, a couple good drawings seen by the right people. Um, All right. But now what about what about writers, Jamie? This is. You know, our audience is 50-50. They right. are half writers, half artists of some kind. Talk, yeah. to, talk to me about what writers need to be thinking about. That is a consistently tough question. Um, writers definitely have the harder road to walk at times because it's easy to say, hey, look at this drawing. And I go, like, that's fantastic. You're the best Spider-Man artist that's ever lived. And it's different than going, like, do you want to read these 20 pages? <laughs> um, and as a writer i know this uh especially as one that used to hang out with a lot of musicians like a three minute song easy uh do i read you know the first three chapters of my novel no um so i've often suggested similar to my path is like if you have if you're out there and sharing your opinions about comics in whatever way you can do and you're able to present a cogent argument for good or bad comics in a way that like if you're say giving a negative review that's not insulting um but is insightful you can get noticed sometimes that way um just joining good conversations uh you know there again it's harder so it's like if you can get some kind of stuff online some samples of portfolio so that when you do grab that attention of you know hey i you know you had a good point about that issue of sonic the hedgehog be like, oh, well, you know, I've written some stuff. Here it is over there. Um, uh, yeah, it's really challenging, unfortunately, for writers because that is the biggest thing. So whatever other work you can do as well, uh, get into anthologies, find artists you can collaborate with, things that allow you to show off and create samples that you can take a look at. Um, and then, you know, be ready just to kind of talk story when you finally do get an editor to listen. And that often is just talking about comic books you love. 
So, you know, I'm talking with, you know, I'm bonding with someone over our mutual love of old Grendel comics, for instance. Look at this. Yeah, Philip Burnett was like, Grendel in the 80s was awesome. So yeah. Philip's all over it. Uh, he's practically uh, drawing uh, one of your titles already now, isn't he? <laughs> Writing and drawing. Well, I, I was like, Freudian oh. slip. He's doing both. With all four digits. <laughs> all four digits. All right, so... Uh, Jamie, we weren't planning to go down this route, um, but it has been a hot topic of conversation in our message boards. The question that we've been uh, talking about is uh, indie creators that are making their own comics and or want to pitch superheroes. Yeah, your nay. What are your thoughts? Because they, we, we are once again split down the middle. I mean, I'm personally split down the middle. The challenge is, is do you have something that really stands apart? Because we're all competing with the same things. Um, we're all competing with these characters that have 80 years behind them, 50 years behind them. So if you think about, say, some of the breakout superheroes from the past 30 years, you've got Hellboy, is that's only Mike Mignola could do. You've got Madman that only Mike Allred could do. Um, so what do you have that singular character inside you? Um, you got Kirkman's Invincible, which takes you know some familiar tropes and tries to pull them, pulls them into something that's a little more extreme. Um, and, you've, and we've seen more of that followed. Um, you know, you had the interesting take on the procedural with powers. By Bendis and Oming. Um, so you got to think about what stood above the pack in the past. Um, because if you're just doing your version of Batman or Green Lantern, um, it's going to have a hard time. Um, I'm the same, Philip. I only went to Camigo for Robotech and then suddenly discovered these other weird comics and became a lifer. Um, so I yeah, for, I, I think I came for the Eternals and stayed for Grendel. I, you I, mean I, Elementals? Uh, elementals, oh, right? yes, right. Elementals as well. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's it. I'm not against it. It's just like it's going to be like, what is this? What can I do with this in the marketplace? How am I going to be able to sell this? Um, you know, it, it. There's been interesting indie superheroes. Actually, Black Hammer is fantastic and and has its own unique take on some things that are familiar, but only Jeff Lemire can do it. Um, and honestly, that's some of the best advice I ever got. And that wasn't that long ago, but Steve Siegel, um, when I was struggling, was sort of like, he's he was looking at stuff I was doing. He's like, some of this is like a, a unique take on a genre, um, but anybody could have a certain take on a genre. Mm -hmm. Identify the books that you can't be replaced on. That's only you could do and pursue that as hard as you can. Um, and so that kind of pa passion is also what's going to come through. Cause that's when you're looking at creator driven stuff on like the side of something like an IDW, it's all about like how much, does, how passionate are you about this story you're going to tell? What's it mean to you? Cause we got a lot of competition. So let's make this the best thing possible and do what we can. Mike, is it the same thing when you're writing television? Can you get excited about what was it? The, the angry orange. The annoying orange. <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> you gotta, you gotta find it deep down inside. You gotta, you gotta go to that special angry place. Got, yeah. Where you got the, the Emmy from? No, no, we got, that was just one of the shows that I wrote on. I um, remember yeah. the annoying orange. Annoying orange, yeah. But yeah, that was a, that was a fun show. Yeah, Mike's mostly known for uh, Robot Chicken, but um, okay. we'll, yeah, we'll, you'll write pretty much anything for cash, right, Mike? Yeah, as long as you're going to pay me, I'll write it. <laughs> and as long as you can wear the bathrobe. Yeah. <laughs> All as right. So, leave the house. So, Jamie, uh, hold on. Let me pull up the next thing. I'll just turn away from the screen here uh, as we, uh, as we get to this. So, Jamie. Uh, Mike, I made a new graphic. I think we'll all be very excited. Jamie, oh, we ask boy. this of every guest. Um, uh, what is one piece of advice that you wish you had received earlier in your career? 
there well there was that steve siegel one um which i probably would have been benefited me better in uh earlier in my writing career um this is gonna sound very cynical but there was a point where one writer turned to me while i was editing and said you know these guys aren't your friends right and that was in in relation to you know some of the talent that was around and how people were behaving and it, there is an aspect of remembering like you guys we all are in this it's a business we can be friendly we can be good but if you let the personal go too far that's where grudges happen it's where feuds happen it's where regrets happen and so there is an aspect of remembering like we're all here to do a job um some folks have something to offer whether it's i can hire you or you know you're a really good artist and this guy you know this right this guy needs a cover um you know at some point you gotta stop and remember you're there to do the work and so be professional about it get it done but also take care of yourself um don't let don't take the bad deal don't do the favor that might not come back like remember that you're there to do a job wow i like that mike that's a good one huh that is a good one yeah i'll have to remember that that wasn't jamie i don't know that wasn't cynical in the least it i guess when i did that as my exit speech at dc it sounded like a lot worse <laughs> no i mean i i think that's you a really good friends <laughs> And you people are nothing to me. Yeah, yeah, I don't like any of you. I never did. Yeah, so that, yeah, if you hang and you slam the door, then it's probably not, <laughs> yeah. you know. And it, I mean, and that's always a good thing, too, is like remembering that, like exit gracefully. Um, we're, I was trading a story today of someone about like weird reactions, weird things you get from people who've submitted and all of that. And, uh, there's always that weird one that like someone you reject someone and they push back on you hard and tell you you're an idiot. And it's just like, do you think that's going to change my mind? <laughs> oh, you're right. I am a fool. Yeah. I should hire you. you I just, what was I thinking? so it, but we remember that too. So when you come back and try to try to pretend it didn't happen, we're like, yeah, I remember you called me. An idiot. Mike, that's why we don't get work anymore. It's true. Oh, yeah. We're we're like, you don't know what you're talking about. Yo, yo, rule the day! <laughs> uh, Philip notes lack of communication quickly breeds mistrust too, and that goes both ways. Like it's up to me to communicate to you as my talent and let you know what's going on. And um, all of us fall into the same bad traps of I'm not reaching out to you to tell you what's going on because I'm waiting for the better news or I'm waiting for this answer to something. And then suddenly three, four days have passed and suddenly you're ghosting the person. And so as either an editor, I need to remember that as a freelancer, you need to remember that, um, you know, I always tell young freelancers, we don't care why we care when, so mm. oh, I didn't get it done because this, this, and that at some point, like we've heard it all. And so you, if you do that too much, we're going to stop trusting the reason unless we really, really know you. But also it's like, it doesn't matter. Like, when are you going to get it done? Like what we can roll with the punches, but we have to know what's coming out the other side. Well, I think as a, as a freelancer, I've dealt with a lot of editors. Um, and I, I think that just, this is just me pontificating. Nobody asked, but I'm going to, I'm going to say it anyway. No is a perfectly acceptable answer. Yes. No, with an explanation is even better. But ghosting, I find immensely frustrating <laughs> and damaging on, on all sides. Yeah. I, I hate like a policy of like if you send in a submission and you don't hear from us by X amount of time, it means you're rejected. One, yeah. most of the time you can't promise that you're going to hit that time frame anyway, particularly in the days of open submissions, which used to be when I was at Dark Horse, I was getting like, I think, several hundred a week. Um but two, if you, I always say, if you have the joy of telling someone yes, the price of that is having to tell the other people no. Just and and no and you know no is no and why? Yeah, you know there have been some editors who have told me why, and they actually helped me make my work better. Yes. So uh, that was that was immensely helpful. So speaking of making everything better, Jamie, 
Uh, the only way that this show can be any better is if we were to shift into the uh, scientifically proven uh, best part of the show, uh, where Mike the Knife Solo, who you see here on the bottom of the screen, Mike, please wave so everybody knows exactly who you are. There you go. Um, gives us a bit of trivia, Jamie. And then we try to come up with uh, what we, we would do with this story. So, Mike, uh, what do we have today? We have uh, today from Northern California, a place called Mount Shasta. And the legends about this place are crazy. These go all the way back to, you know, the early settlers, the Native Americans who lived around the mountain. And they believed it was the center of the universe and home of the creator. Because there are lots of strange things that happen there. And then years down the line, you know, with the legends that are building, um, they say that there is an underground uh, city called Telos inhabited by the Lemurians. Hmm. And the Lemurians were uh, a race of ancient people supposedly around the, uh, the time that the Atlanteans were here. And they got into this big war with the Atlanteans. And their war started the flood um, that sank Atlantis. And the Lemurians, some for some reasons, uh, fled to Mount Shasta and started their own uh, little underground dwelling there. Now, Mike, uh, since you uh, since you you came up with this, by the way, uh, Jamie, he must really like you. This is a uh, you can see right there. It's a four minute read. So he put four whole minutes into digesting this for you. Um, <laughs> Mike, what what would you what would you do with the Shasta mysteries? It doesn't look like a lot you can do with this. What, what, uh, there, I think there's quite a bit because there's I mean there's UFO stories, there's Bigfoot stories, there's everything that centers all around this mountain. Um, there's even uh, um, stories that there's it's a portal, like the aliens, the the UFOs will fly into the mountain, not crash, but just never come out. So there's a supposedly a portal that you know. Um, if you need some uh, some story ideas, like hikers are there looking for what's going on around Mount Shasta, and they find the portal that takes them to, say, an alternate reality, some distant world, some distant part of the universe. Um, if you want to use the uh, Telos for the Lemurian story, it could be something like a Brigadoon, hmm. where it only appears every you know few thousand years, and some friends or a group of uh, treasure hunters find it. You know, are they good? Are they bad? Do they want to start a war? Or they just kind of want to sing and dance a little because who doesn't like singing and dancing? Well, Jamie doesn't like singing and dancing. He told <laughs> me just before the show, he was like, we're not doing singing and dancing. I'm not singing and I'm definitely not dancing. This is Jamie. like foot, foot loose around here. Like. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jamie, uh, you've uh, you've been given the trivia prompt. What are your thoughts? Where do you go with this? I thought I was going to actually answer a real trivia question, not be have someone sneak a pitch in on me. No, no, you, you're you're pitching the audience. You're going to tell us what your great idea is and what you would do with the Shasta mysteries. Like, where would you go with this? I is this where I can pretend I'm in the WGA and I'm not allowed to write on? Right now? <laughs> you know what? Good, 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 uh, good. Right. I'm going to say, uh, Mike. I'm going to say that in in my story. Uh, somebody goes to the Shasta Mountains uh, and discovers uh, Shasta soda in that's, the real old they bottle it. <laughs> that are still in my grandmother's house. So that's uh, that's where I go, and they drink the swing, the apple, and the grape. The grape, obviously, being a classic fla flavor that you could pick up from the '70s and still drink today, it's totally fine. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, that's a good one. I'm going to go with the, the Lemurians are actually a group of people who worship Jeff Lemire and they all wear rubber masks that look just like <laughs> Jeff Lemire. And all they do is read his comics all day and watch the Sweet Tooth TV show. And just like that's they, they deny all other existence. And so my crashing into their lives disrupts everything. And so I'm the infidel that either has to become a Lemire or leave. That's a good one. That's oh, wait, good hold one. on. Let, let's give him. Hold on. I think I have a. I think I have a. Let's do the. <laughs> I think. I think Jamie won this round, Mike. I think Jamie has won this round. He did win this round. This round was won. Uh, there, uh, Philip was saying there is a yes. kind of a witch mountain. Yep. Vibe there. Oh wait, not the soda one. The witch mountain one. Uh, and then. Um, 
And then Glenn said, it's like Skinwalker Ranch. What is Skinwalker Ranch? Does he mean Skywalker Ranch? No, there is a Skinwalker thing. I don't really know. the. Uh, maybe that's what I'll do next week. Skinwalker Ranch. That's kind of creepy. It's the nickname for Skywalker Ranch. That's what really goes on. <laughs> The people that go and never come back. Yeah. yeah every episode, every Star Wars has a happy ending. So, you know what, guys? Uh, like, comment, and subscribe. You know the routine. Um, and, Jamie, uh, where can they find you in the socials? And what should they be looking for at their comic shop uh, this Thursday? Oh, gosh. What's coming out this week? I'm always a few weeks away, a few weeks ahead. Well, what should they just look for in general? We already know that they have to look for uh, G. Willow Wilson's book. What else would you like for them to look for? So you can find me on Instagram. It's the only social I have. Um, I think it's just Jamie underscore S underscore Rich. Um, and my bio will honestly tell you that I own a pug and I go to a lot of concerts. And that's about all you're going to see. Um, <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. So I'm actually out of here after this to go see Sisters of Mercy with Chip Mosier from Distillery. So uh, that, that'll that be tonight. Um, and congratulate Chip for us. We're going to try to get Chip on the show uh, as well. Congratulate him for, he's, for that he's effort. He's been texting me because he didn't get the memo. Like, don't disturb. Um, uh, coming to shops, actually. So the, the thing that <laughs> thing I've edited at IDW is a series called Godzilla, Here There Be Dragons. Um, it is set in the time of Sir Fran Francis Drake uh, the English, and the English pirates in the Spanish Armada. Um, and basically there is a group of pirates who are searching for this island where supposedly there's lots of treasure. Um, in reality, it is there is treasure there, but also Godzilla because it's Monster Island. Um, so that's coming out in June. It's written by Frank Thierry. Uh, drawn by Inyaki Miranda and colored by Eva De La Cruz. And it's just a fun adventure. Godzilla fights a bunch of different monsters. Um, for those who know the phrase, here there be dragons, that's you know when the map wasn't complete and they believed over there it's a bunch of dragons. Well, turns out, yes, it was Monster Island. And what I'm going to guess is since Frank Thierry is writing it, it's going to be over-the-top fun and full of... Great, violent, and creative action. <laughs> yes. And then Inyaki uh, is someone I've worked with before. He and Frank did Old Lady Harley together. Um, but he's also had this really great uh, mini series called We Live that was coming from Aftershock um, and just becomes just a better and better artist. Um, so he's really bringing some fantastic uh, art to it. Um, we got variant covers by Tyler Kirkham and Scott Godlewski. It's just kind of, uh, I don't have to edit anything, but I saw that in the pile and was like, Hey, I should edit this Frank Thierry book. <laughs> uh, and then yeah, found Inyaki and from there. Um, so, so yeah, that's the big thing I have coming. Um, well, that sounds great. And hold on. Let's see another guy. No, now Gajira is playing with Mastodon this summer. Gojira. Oh, is that the name of a band? Go yes. Oh, thank you. I think Glenn likes some hard music. Come yeah, on. Glenn. Glenn is a, yeah, and and Glenn is on on every show, Jamie. He's he's on every episode. You should uh, you should be honored by the great Glenn. <laughs> I think Jim Lee was at Sick New World, Glenn. I don't know if you were, but he was probably hanging out with System of a Down and all those guys. Jim Lee, another another uh, guy that what did they make him uh, president, president of BC, right? Yeah, president. Um, also, a thing I work on that's related, uh, Alan Robert, who is the bassist uh, in the metal band Life of Agony, and from they're like an East Coast sensation. European, he's going on. He's he actually talking today. He's leaving for a tour starting in Romania. Um, he does coloring books for us called Beauty of Horror, hmm. and we it does all kinds of. Uh, he takes pop culture references. I actually got one here. Uh, he's, he's got, got a nice here. bookshelf here, huh, Mike? He's got yeah. You get a lot, all this the is actually the most recent one, Beauty Horror Six, where it's all um, monstrous masterpieces, uh, or famous monster pieces, where he just takes paintings and turns them into something ghoulish. Wow, Probably lots of red. Yeah, so he colored. So it's a coloring book. This is volume six, um, the, which is the first one I worked on, which just means I make sure it comes together nicely. And then we are doing a Beauty Horror. There's a tarot set that we just reprinted as a book. 
um, so you can color the tarot as well. So that those are things yeah. that I'm personally working with. Yeah, he's he's got a good comp list. I'm like, remember when yeah. we, we used to get all free stuff like Jamie gets? It's fun, right? Yeah, I wish free stuff would come to us now. Well, mm. you can have a free robe. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> so Jamie, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to put you back in all the right. green room. Uh, it is loaded with Twizzlers. Feel free to eat as many as you want. And uh, we, uh, Mike will do the sign off. So don't go away. How about that? huh, Mike. That's impressive. That is impressive. The way he uh, he's uh, moved around from company to company. And now he's at the, the, the top position. He's guiding the ship as they say. Yeah. He's the man. He's the man in charge. He is the man in charge. So, Pretty exciting. Have you, Do you read any IDW titles? I haven't read IDW in a long time. Well, hold on. Jamie, we're going to start reading IDW uh, because of you. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jamie's okay with that. Do you get I a commission on uh, on each issue that? No, unfortunately. Um, so you don't get like a nickel or anything? No. We'll read them anyway. <laughs> we always hear about those days when, the, when Marvel gave royalties and Bob Harris at editing X Men. He used to rub that in our face when he was editor in chief at TC. <laughs> yeah, oh, that was nice. Yeah. That was really nice. Huh? Yeah. Well, all right. So, Mike, we uh, we get fifty cents every time this show airs. So, I hope yeah. people just yeah. keep on rewatching the show. We actually don't get anything. Um, but uh, a great show, Mike. Thanks for uh, thanks for being you, and thanks for everybody for joining us. Uh, we'll see you next Tuesday uh, where we'll do other fun and interesting things. All right, Mike. We'll see you. Good night. Good night.